Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. What are the chances of success for the talks to end the war on Gaza? Let's get to the bottom line. It's been a war unlike any other in modern times, with tens of thousands killed, almost 100,000 injured, millions of people turned homeless, widespread hunger and disease, and total destruction of the health care and education systems, all within months. But Israel's war on Gaza rages on, with dozens of Palestinians killed on a daily basis. For the longest time, U.S. officials have argued that it was too early to call on Israel to cease fire in Gaza. But now they're saying there's nothing more that Israel can achieve militarily. And it's time for a deal with Hamas to end the fighting and release all Israeli captives and some Palestinian prisoners. Talks to reach such a deal have been held through mediators on and off for months. And to hear U.S. officials speak, a final agreement is close. But how close is it, really? Today we're talking with Joost Hilterman, the program director for the Middle East and North Africa at International Crisis Group. Joost, thank you so much for joining us. Look, a lot of the commentators, and I'm uncomfortable with this, have been talking about this effort to get a ceasefire in Gaza, the quote-unquote last chance. Do you agree with that? And what are your, um, you know, signals that you see right now around a potential ceasefire? Or is this going to be an ongoing story? So, first of all, thanks a lot, Steve, for having me on the program. It's really a pleasure. Sorry for my informal appearance. I'm in southern Italy. It's very hot here. I'm in a coffee shop in a public place. The, uh, you know, it is going to be an ongoing affair whether there's going to be a ceasefire in Gaza or not. Uh, if there's a ceasefire in Gaza, it's anyone's guess how long it will last. Um, it is anyone's guess if it will apply only to Gaza, as it is supposed to. Uh, but that can also prevent a, a wider war, say, in Lebanon. Um, and, uh, and it's anybody's guess at this point whether there will be a ceasefire. Uh, last chance, you know, the last chance, uh, is, that's a very subjective uh, issue. Um, if it doesn't happen this week and uh, Anthony Blinken goes home, you know, without the result, um, there's nothing to say that it's, it won't, it can't happen a month from, from now. Uh, this story has been going on for, for months now. Um, so why would it come to an end now? I don't know. Um, the Biden administration seems keen uh, to, to get it done this time. But I think the two sides are still very far apart. You know, so let me ask you about something. And I may be crazy here, but I can't remember a time where in another major conflict, uh, one of the principals in the conflict assassinated the other uh, party's chief negotiator and in a way, if you read the New York Times, if you read the Washington Post, everything seems to be hunky-dory, like it's no big impact that the head of Hamas's political wing was assassinated. Or it's no big deal. Maybe Iran will retaliate, uh, retaliate. Maybe Iran won't retaliate. But everyone's acting like things are stable enough to get a deal. Now, am I wrong to think there's, there's something wrong with that equation? You know, ever since October 7th, um, everyone's any of the major actors in the conflict, everyone's calculus has changed. And we've seen a, a gradual or incremental uh, escalation. Uh, not a, uh, a major one, other than the October 7th attack itself, um, but an uh, escalation uh, between uh, Israel and Hezbollah, between Israel and Iran, uh, between armed groups that are part of the Iranian alliance uh, against Israeli and American interests in the region. So um, at this point, it's, it is uh, we're in a different uh, environment in which acts that previously would have precipitated a major response don't anymore. Now, Iran and Hezbollah have both vowed to respond for the assassinations that took place on their territories, uh, but they're also keen to prevent a, a regional war from breaking out. And so if they find a way to avoid it, then they will, they will take that opportunity, I think. And the, the way to avoid it is through a Gaza ceasefire. And everybody seems to be agreed on that. So that's what it's all about, right? One of the uh, pieces I've read of yours recently in Foreign Affairs magazine titled America, Iran, and the Patron's Dilemma is very interesting because you look at the, the problem 
that these principal stakeholders who were not involved with October 7th, but you're looking, they're looking at the problem of their proxies, of their, you know, uh, uh, clients, if you will. And I'm interested in this dynamic of Hezbollah, of the Houthis in Yemen, you know, around Iran. So we're not just seeing a negotiation essentially between Israel and Hamas. We're seeing a negotiation of surround sound parties of this. Can you go into some of the complexity of that? Yes. So prior to October 7th, there was such a thing as the uh, Iran-backed axis of resistance. Or Iran was part of it, was maybe the mastermind of it. Uh, but Hezbollah and Lebanon was part of it, the Houthis in Yemen, some paramilitary groups in Iraq, and also Hamas, nominally. Now, what may have happened on October 7th is that Yahya Sinwa, the head of the political bureau of Hamas in Gaza, calculated that if he were to carry out a major attack on Israel that would serve Hamas' purposes in Gaza, that by doing so, he would draw in the other members of the Axis. Um, that is not quite what happened, and it's clear that Hamas at the time was quite obsessed about the fact that Iran did not uh, step up its own efforts against Israel at the time. What did happen was uh, Hezbollah uh, did escalate to some extent, but has been very careful not to overstep uh, red, uh, a, a red line. Nobody knows exactly where the red line lies, but there is some common understanding of where the red lines are, and has been very careful not to uh, violate, uh, violate that red line. The Houthis, more or less the same, the Iraqi paramilitary groups also. Frustrating to Hamas, uh, but all the same uh, response by these groups and, and, and a, a notification that, um, you know, you can do these things, but that was really not the purpose of the axis, because in the end, the axis is there to defend Iran. It's Iran's shield against an Israeli attack on Iranian territory. Um, so it wants to be able to call these groups into action according to its own interest, not according to their interest. But of course, Iran cannot control these groups 100%. And that is why Hamas did what it did in October 7th. It acted without prior agreements with Iran, maybe without prior notification. We don't know the exact details. And the interesting thing is, is that, of course, this is a big client uh, relationship. We see the same thing with the United States and Israel, uh, where the United States can say to Israel, don't do this, don't do that, and you should now uh, sue for a ceasefire, and then Israel does it. Because Prime Minister Netanyahu is pursuing his own interest, which is his political survival. And this is the dilemma that both sides face, in a, in a way, is that the, the patrons can't control their, their clients. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, I've talked to senior CIA officials, I've talked to senior Qatari negotiators, um, both who've said that Iran and Hamas want a deal more than the media may recognize, and the party that does not want a deal is Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, even though there are hostages at stake and whatnot. So I'm interested in your, you know, sensibilities of this. So I think both sides want a deal, but they want it on their own terms, right? And the question is, you know, what the United States is saying now, they want to find a, a bridging mechanism between the two polar opposites. Um, Hamas doesn't want a deal that doesn't bring a permanent end to the fighting in Gaza and a total withdrawal of, of you know, Israeli troops from the Gaza Strip, and then to the military occupation that has been there since 1967. Israel is certainly not prepared to do that. Uh, it is willing to consider a temporary ceasefire that would allow for the release of the hostages that Hamas is holding uh, in exchange for uh, the release of prisoners that Israel is holding. Uh, and, and, uh, but there are many other details that we have to be worked out, and this is why uh, we haven't seen the ceasefire yet. Now, from the Hamas side, I have seen no discordant voice from the beginning about this. Hamas has spoken in a single voice, even if, and we know, there are differences within Hamas about these things, but when it comes to uh, the final word publicly, they're on one, they're speaking, playing on the same music sheet. Israel, on the other hand, it's very clear that the Israeli uh, ruling circle is deeply divided. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu may want a ceasefire, but he clearly doesn't want a ceasefire that would uh, prevent him from eventually destroying Hamas and its military capability in the Gaza Strip. Uh, whereas the security establishment takes a longer view, 
saying we should agree to a ceasefire because we definitely need to bring the hostages home safety, uh, safely. But And then we'll see. Uh, because at the moment, Hamas is no longer capable of carrying out any major attack on Israel for some time. It may shoot some rockets, rockets but they won't go anywhere. Um, they certainly cannot do what he did on October 7th. And the greatest threat at the moment is Hezbollah in Lebanon. So let's turn to that. So this is the divide in Israel, and it has not been resolved. So the main fight going on right now is between Netanyahu and his senior advisors. So the U.S. military leaders in Washington are now saying that Israel cannot achieve anything militarily uh, more at this point. And that's one of the reasons why these talks uh, matter so much, is that the military campaign and any fruits that might come from that uh, to Israel, you know, are gone. I guess my question to you is, you know, in this, in this process now, um, do, do you think that we've achieved a, a real inflection point, or is this going to be like the Oslo peace process, where it's become all process and no peace? Yeah, that would be a, a sad outcome. It's certainly uh, possible. Um, and, and, of course, um, uh, you could have a, an extended war of attrition, basically, both on the Gaza front and on the Lebanon front. But there is huge risk that inheres in this kind of um, uh, volatile status quo, uh, which is that um, uh, there, any, any kind of incident based on a misinterpretation, miscommunication, uh, uh, misfiring of a rocket, uh, as we've seen actually already on a number of occasions, could uh, precipitate uh, a, a larger uh, war. Now, in Gaza, uh, we've already seen what a large war can do. It has devastated uh, the, the Strip, and it has made it uninhabitable for the 2.2 million people who live there. But in Lebanon, uh, this would be the next disaster that would strike. And so the status quo, uh, the, uh, and, and looking at this as a, a process, is, is, is a very bad way, because uh, it, it may not hold for very long. I think it's absolutely desperately uh, necessary to come to a ceasefire in Gaza and move from that to uh, negotiations about an arrangement in Lebanon that can survive. Remember that after the 2006 war in Lebanon, uh, the, um, the border area knew 17 years of peace, of relative peace and stability. People were able to live on both sides of the border. Right now, we have... Uh, 80,000 people displaced on one side and 80,000 plus people displaced on the other side. That's untenable. That's unsustainable. I'd love to get your take on the West Bank as well, because while we're focused a lot on uh, essentially terror killings and, and, and just the destruction of total society in Gaza, there's this ongoing erosion of security, of land, harassment on the West Bank. And Again, thinking in terms of peacemaking, ceasefires, and regional stability, do you see any uh, prospect that some of the uh, pressure on the West Bank will become part of this deal and will go in a different direction? So, now, in a way, you know, what the Gaza conflict brought out was the risk of continuing uh, the Israeli conflict without any kind of process at all mm. that has the potential of uh, leading to a peace deal. So the absence of peace is creating situations that can only spin out of control, uh, as it did in uh, October 2023, and will again uh, in the future in the West Bank. You already saw uh, there was violence uh, a couple of days ago when Israeli settlers raided a Palestinian village. Uh, even the Israeli leadership condemned it, but the fact is that the, the settlers can act almost at will. Uh, none are prosecuted, or very few are prosecuted, if at all. Um, and uh, the situation is, is totally inflammable. Um, and since October 7th, it has gotten worse because uh, more and more settlers have uh, entered the ranks of the Israeli military that is deployed in the West Bank. And so um, when, when Palestinians face uh, set, violent settlers, uh, the army that is there to theoretically protect the settlers, but also the Palestinian population, are actually clearly on the side of the settlers more than they have been in the past, and they always have been uh, to some extent. So um, the situation is, is really, really dangerous if there is no settlement, 
of the war in Gaza. Uh, Palestinians in the West Bank uh, have only to fear that the situation there will also increasingly get out of hand. That's why it's so important that we build on the war in Gaza and on the opportunity that the ceasefire in Gaza offers to move towards uh, uh, a, a new effort at reaching a peace deal. Now, this is not going to be easy, but it has to be for the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem. Um, and we need to go back to that. And so uh, and the only, you know, uh, sensible solution to the conflict remains a two-state solution. Whether it is possible, whether it's feasible, is another question that the negotiators will have to, uh, uh, to answer. It will have to require major sacrifice, major compromises on both sides. Well, to that end, let me ask you a, a delicate question. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. You know, I, I sort of think it's interesting that the empathy that many in the Middle East feel for Gazans right now is very strong. But the government of Jordan has not ripped up its peace treaty with Israel. The government of Egypt has not ripped up its peace treaty is, with Israel. We are hearing from Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman through sources that he worries about assassination. If he were his own assassination, if he were to do a deal normalizing with Israel without resolving uh, a Palestinian state and without creating a Palestinian state. So I'm interested in whether or not there is a substantial gap that we're not talking enough about between uh, the, the so-called Arab street and the leadership that has thus far, you know, maybe talked a lot about what's happening in Gaza, but they haven't made uh, any consequential moves in, in my book that, that matter substantially uh, in their relations with Israel. So if you want to put it in black and white terms, which probably we shouldn't, but just for, for clarity, um, you know, the, the Arab street is pro-Palestinian and the Arab regimes are anti-Palestinian. And there is nothing new about that. That has always been the case. But ever since October 7th, in particular, the Arab regimes know and realize, come to realize that they cannot do anything that uh, would go counter uh, to uh, the interests of Palestinians because it would further inflame their own populations against them. Uh, so they have to to, uh, to, to to walk a very careful line. Uh, remember that just three or four years ago, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, uh, basically came to agreement with Israel to normalize diplomatic relations. Um, that was possible then. Um, it's certainly not possible today to move on that in that way, and that's why Saudi Arabia is clearly hesitating on that front. And that is also why uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is is, is worried about maybe I don't know, were said to be worried about his his safety. But what we have seen, of course, is that while the Jordanian regime and the Egyptian regime are not Palestinian, the Jordanian regime is in a special place because, of course, it has a very large. Palestinian origin population, Queen herself is Palestinian origin. Um, and, um, and they know that they have only so many levers to play against Israel. If they were to, uh, to, 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 to break off the peace treaty now, they would lose that leverage that they have uh, with Israel. And their main fear, their only fear, and the Palestinians' only fear, is that Israel will drive the Palestinians from the West Bank into Jordan. This would be an existential uh, crisis for Jordan. So they want to prevent this at all costs, and the only way to do it is to make, uh, uh, just make very clear to Israel that this is the thickest of red lines. Um, and that, um, uh, but they couldn't do that if they had already broken off the peace treaty. For Egypt, it's similar, even though uh, the, the population makeup, of course, is very different in Egypt, uh, the Palestinian refugees, but there's no Palestinian origin population of any size. Um, uh, and, of course, the Palestinians from Gaza, if they were to flee into Egypt, they would end up in the, in the Gaza, I'm sorry, in the Sinai Desert uh, initially. So uh, the threat is a bit different from Jordan. Um, but uh, all the same, Egypt also doesn't want to trade away the leverage that it has. So it uh, uh, makes clear to Israel what its red lines are, and it begs the United States to lean on Israel to not to... Uh, the worst case scenario, which is to drive Palestinians out of historic Palestine. Look, at the, at the time of our talking right now, uh, the Democratic National Convention has started. Uh, by the time the world sees this, there, there may be substantial protests in Chicago, 
in and around um, the, the rise of Kamala Harris as the uh, Democratic candidate for president. And we've seen many younger people organize on college campuses around the country and define the Gaza crisis, not just in terms of Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, tensions and Palestinian justice, but around a big racial and social justice issue. And I'm interested in your insights there, even among European youth. Is there something going on generationally right now that hasn't gone on for a long time that is going to change the dynamic of Israel and Palestine, and particularly given the U.S. political context right now? So, well, first of all, uh, our kids are in the U.S., and they uh, are going through this uh, and, and are clearly expressing also the views that are consistent uh, with what you are saying. Um, uh, there is huge uh, sympathy for the Palestinians, for Palestinians for what they are going through in Gaza at the moment, and more broadly as a people that has been, is being dispossessed systematically uh, and, and oppressed. So, um, uh, and, and I think it's very much alive among young people. We saw it in campus protests in the spring. Uh, students are going to come back to universities now in the, in the fall, and we'll see uh, as, the, uh, as we get closer to the elections how this is going to play out. In Europe, you see the same. But frankly, it is not limited it's only to the younger generation. Um, people, uh, especially in, in the bureaucracies here, in the governments, you see that mid-level people who are... Um, you know, dealing uh, with any number of issues, developments, for example, distributing development aid in the European Union, of course, is very wealthy, giving out a lot of aid uh, to various countries. Now, their diplomats uh, are received, uh, if they are received at all, uh, because they may be turned back at the door, uh, but received with a very, very, uh, in a very cold, uh, cold attitude of, uh, you know, you're on the wrong side of history, you are on the side of the oppressor. Um, you know, you are on the, on the side of the, of, of the country that is committing genocide. Um, and so we don't want to deal with you anymore, certainly not on the terms that you give us. Um, it has a huge impact here. Um, but uh, and European countries are, are, we are totally dependent on what the U.S. government does when it comes to Israel-Palestine. That is the sad truth. And if the United States government were to take a stronger approach, uh, it would be applauded worldwide. Um, uh, and, and if uh, Kamala Harris as presidential candidate and maybe eventually as president, will take stronger steps that will be widely applauded. But right now, uh, she is perceived as being part of the Biden uh, administration's approach, uh, even though she has sounded uh, a little bit more flexible uh, when it comes to Gaza than the President Biden has. Um, but uh, it is still far from what uh, people are demanding, uh, unless, you know, you are a strong ally with us. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Joost Hilterman, Program Director for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. Thank you so much for joining us today from that coffee shop in Calabria. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Steve. It was an absolute pleasure. So what's the bottom line? A ceasefire deal may or may not have happened by the time this show airs. It's literally become a day-by-day -day process. U.S. officials are calling the talks, quote, a last chance. But that's just naive. There's always another chance to make things better or to make them much worse. You know how it takes people just a few seconds to resolve a Rubik's Cube? Well, in the Rubik's Cube of the Middle East, there is an Israeli prime minister who just doesn't want the region's issues to be resolved, for justice for all to be achieved, and for this conflict to end. That is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He has virtually no interest in a real ceasefire deal. And as long as he remains in power, this story simply is not going to end. And that's the bottom line.